Hello, and welcome to NAIS Member Voices. I'm Scott Donaldson, Member Engagement Director at the National Association of Independent Schools. This month, we're talking about financial sustainability through the lens of a tuition reset. My colleague, Jackie Wolking, speaks with Nancy Lang, head of school at the New School in Fayetteville, Arkansas, about how she identified and addressed an erosion of trust in her market, and adjusted to thinking about tuition strategically long-term instead of just year-to-year. They discuss how Nancy's school approached messaging, getting board buy-in, and generally making sure everyone was on the same page. Nancy also shares how she keeps a boundary between work and life, her impatience for the important things, and how a 100-mile run convinced her that she can do anything. I'll turn it over to Jackie. Thanks, Scott. Nancy, welcome to Member Voices. Thank you so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So we're going to start the conversation today with kind of the broad sweeping topic of innovation. So I'd love to know kind of what does the term innovation mean to you, uh, specifically when you think about innovation in financial sustainability? First of all, I would say that people who know me probably wouldn't use the word innovative to describe me, at least not as one of their first words. I know that the word is utilized in a lot of places in education and other places. But for me, I think of it as one of my mentors taught me about being impatient for the important things. And so I think impatience can be a real motivator, a powerful motivator to kind of have you either be innovative or open to someone who is. So for me, it's important. And you say for financial sustainability, I mean, I need the financial sustainability to be able to develop the leaders that we need for our future. And that's what I'm impatient about. So I think for me, I am a person who has a pretty high tolerance for ambiguity. So my work is to embrace uncertainty and be curious and open-minded and surround myself, you know, with people who are smarter than I am so that I can be open to those, those really great ideas in rethinking some of the approaches that we've had. That's great. Yeah. I love the idea of kind of impatient for important things and how it creates that sense of urgency. I mean, specifically for, you know, today's conversation, we'd love to kind of dig into innovation specifically around kind of tuition and enrollment management. So I'm wondering kind of what's been the thing that keeps you up at night when it comes to (laughs) the challenges with managing tuition and enrollment at the new school? Well, you know, we're not real. Our model isn't really that different from other schools who are similar to us. So we're a day school. We serve one-year-old through 12th grade. We have about 450 students. We're in a market that is not particularly familiar with independent schools. I think that that scenario isn't hugely different from a number of our schools at NAS around the country. I think that what challenged us was that both both from a tuition and compensation standpoint is that we started as an early childhood program and kind of built on it one grade at a time. And then soon after we started our upper school, we experienced some significant turnover. So I think the disruption that we face disrupted some of the the kind of approaches to thinking about tuition as a strategic move long term, as opposed to what are we going to do this year? That sort of was the big challenge I faced. It's funny when people ask me what keeps me up at night, because I'm generally past the stage of letting work keep me up at night. I love my school and I love my job, but I also value my sanity and health. So not much keeps me up at night in terms of work. But the thing that's really present for me is that the school has a, a tremendous history, and in order to keep doing the work that we're going to do, we've got to have the financial sustainability, and we need to be sensitive to our market. And I think we saw an opportunity a few years ago to make this adjustment right within our market and to try to build trust through it. And I think that that's, you know, it's a business and it's a, and it's a school. So we, we really need to nurture the community. So, yeah, so I think that sort of walking into that was one of the, the biggest challenge, but how we faced it and how we walked through it to me was what felt innovative to us. We certainly weren't the first to do it, but yeah, that was an exciting process for us to go through. Well, first and foremost, thank you for that excellent example of keeping a boundary (laughs) between work and life. Um, I'm I'm really happy to hear that a lot of work doesn't keep you up at night. And then secondly, I think what you 
are alluding to, right? It's just like the the market and you found this opportunity in a market that I guess, like you said, wasn't really familiar with independent schools. How can you kind of bridge that gap? And so maybe again, for this conversation, if you could maybe walk us through, I know you all did a tuition reset fairly recently, but if maybe you could walk us through kind of what that decision was like for you and, and how that kind of connected all the dots and taking this innovative approach and, and what it meant for your school, if you could maybe Bring us back to the inception and, and what was it like to, to make that decision and, and start to get it up and running? Absolutely. First of all, I'm starting my fifth year. I'm in my fifth year at the school. And I, you know, I want to give credit to those, those around me. When I arrived, we had a director of enrollment in place who had only been here a year. And his assessment was that we might be outpriced in our market, that we might be outpricing our families. And so while that was at the idea, at the at the time, only an idea. It was present for me. It you know it had been shared with me. But when I walked in, you know, we had exit surveys from the families that were leaving. I mentioned that there was a big leadership turnover that resulted in you know a significant amount of attrition and an erosion in the trust. You know, in in uh, in the school and I, I think you know even in the administration that was coming in. So we did exit surveys. I did a very structured listening tour and what both. Both of those pointed to was a combination of frustration with the cost and an erosion of the trust within the community. So those two pieces to me, at the time, I didn't see them as as intermingled as, as they really are. I thought, well, wow, these are two big, two, two big challenges we need to tackle. So what happened was right away that year, we responded and said, we heard you. We're going to kind of hit the pause button and do just a small tuition increase to, you know, to get us through a year. We're going to increase tuition by 1% because we heard you and, you know, we want, we don't want to do too much. And that was a, that was a big step for the board. But then of course COVID hit. And so I'm really glad we had done that because I don't know that we would have held on to the family, you know, as many families as we did. COVID did hit our enrollment. It impacted us in a negative way, but what happened was coming out of it, we were committed to open campus and, and we did, and that was the first, you know, big step toward, okay, you know, you can believe that we're going to say, we're going to do what we're going to do. And there was some trust building going on right away that year, the director of enrollment, the CFO, CFO and I started meeting weekly to seriously consider a new tuition model. So we looked at our, our data. We looked backward to look at financial assistance as a percentage of tuition revenue. We looked at NTR. We looked at enrollment fluctuations with temp, uh, the changes in tuition. We looked at how much financial aid we were awarding to our upper school. We looked at the NAIS market view to help understand our community better. So we started, you know, playing, basically. We just said, well, what if we did this? What if we did this? And we played a number of different scenarios out. And we used those, all those bits of data to make some hypotheses and then run the model and see what would happen. And so as we did that, I kept our board chair updated on our thinking. And I think we went all over the place from, you know, do we do a small increase? Do we freeze? You know, do we level it? Because we had different tuitions at different grade levels. And so all those things came up, but I would keep the board chair involved. And then when the time was right, we engaged the full board. And uh, our board is and was then and is now very healthy. Um, and they engaged fully. They dug into the details. They considered our forecasts. We met many additional times beyond our regularly scheduled meetings. And Ultimately, where we landed was a full tuition reset where we reduced tuition across the board and then we leveled it so that all of our early childhood has one tuition and all of our K-12 has one tuition. And the messaging, you know, that we, were, that we shared eventually, but the, the reasoning behind that was to make it predictable for our families that they would know, they could project out what their tuition increases would be over time and that it wouldn't feel like surprises every year and you wouldn't get hit hard when you move from one level to the next. So ultimately, they voted in December for a full reset and we announced it in January. And yeah, I mean, I can give more details there, but that's kind of how we got through it. Yeah, no, it's really, really helpful to kind of hear what happened behind the scenes when you were considering the idea and then ultimately kind of how you got to that decision. I'm curious, what what was the reaction like from the community? What have been the results thus far? One of the other things we did before, you know, so we had this vote in December, knowing that we were going to make an announcement in January. So when we started to see where the board conversations were going, we, by 
early December and were pretty confident that this is the direction we were going in. So we had to get some things, uh, our ducks in a row, right, beforehand. You know, we looked at some other schools, really some higher ed schools, and I think a couple of independent schools who had done this. And one of the things that we were advised was you only get one shot at this. <laughs> you, don't, you don't get to do this twice, and you, and you certainly don't get to have a redo if you do it wrong. So we wanted to make sure that the way we did the messaging was important to us and that we, that we reached all of our constituents, both current and then potential, right? So we did partner with Schoolcraft, who partnered with me to do the presentation we did on this at NAIS, and created a nine-week, very detailed marketing strategy that was 100% digital. So we announced it, and we did a tiered announcement within our community. We talked to faculty and staff first. We assured them that even with a tuition reset, that they would get a compensation increase because we didn't want them to feel that they could draw their own conclusions that this meant that we were going to reduce their salaries or anything crazy like that. So we started there and then and explained the why behind it around accessibility and how important it was to have a diverse community and that we wanted to make more children in our area have access to our education. So what happened? Yeah, we decreased tuition by 13 made 13 and a half percent. Our net tuition revenue increased almost 12 percent. Our enrollment increased almost 20 percent in that jump year. So yeah, the, the, the reaction and the response was very positive. I would say that families, we got a lot of personal thank yous, but families were incredibly excited. And I think that the biggest thing was it went a long way toward inspiring some trust. You know, we were transparent. We had a lot of communication. We explained, we heard you, we are responding to your, what we heard from you, your feelings, and then we followed it. This was kind of a big step for us, and this was one that was very interesting for the board to take, but we followed it with a freeze. So we actually reduced tuition one year, and then the next year we froze tuition, and we gave a very strong message that we can't do this forever. However, we're coming out of a tough economic time for people, and so going forward, you should anticipate cost of living type tuition increases each year. And so in that freeze year, again, we had, we had increased enrollment and increased revenue. And that was, you know, I think that really did go a long way toward building community. So That's so wonderful. And I'm so excited to hear those results for, for the new school. And I'm, I'm curious too about this piece around the trust that you were able to build. And it sounds like, you know, the transparency that you had, the communication that you were able to enact both internally and externally, right, with within staff and faculty, but also within the larger community. And then, you know, the larger Northwest Arkansas community sounded amazing. But I'm curious, too, just like, what are other factors you think that are critical for like the culture of the school for this type of idea to thrive? Well, I think one is definitely, and I know it's not necessarily culture of the school, but it leads the culture of the school is the health of the board. I mean, I think that if the board was able to dig into these conversations and have the kind of rich, curious conversations in the boardroom that they needed to have to believe, truly believe that this was the right thing for the school. Because had this been one of those things that had been pushed through by a small group that not everybody believed was right, we would not have been set up for success, right? There would have been backdoor conversations. And so the health of the board was critical. And I'm, I'm eternally grateful for that. I think the other thing that was present was a hunger for the community. Like people wanted to belong. People wanted to be a part of something. And we had just gone through this whole time with COVID where we closed and then we said we'd open and we opened. And I think that it had been expressed that the school had been this wonderful place and that the disruption had maybe caused a little erosion of that trust. But I think people were hungry for it. People wanted it. So I, I think people were open to it. And that was very real to me. You know, I felt that people were kind to each other. And so when you come up with this, anybody who came back in came in with curiosity, help me understand how you're doing this. And to me, when I'm getting knocks on my door that are either curious or grateful or feedback in a really constructive way, I think that's healthy. So I do think they were ready for it. That speaks a lot to just that openness and willingness. I think you spoke to in the beginning about what does innovation mean, right? When it comes to financial sustainability, right? It's almost the 
exploratory nature that your board took and getting everyone involved. That sounds like it was really successful. Plus that hunger to be part of the community, which is what you know, made this tuition reset work. So that's really, really, again, exciting to hear. I'm curious too about what areas you went to for inspiration. I know you mentioned you maybe researched some higher ed institutions or other independent schools, but were there other areas of inspiration on this topic for you or kind of key pieces of advice that you got along the way? Well, I mean, I think, I think that was, those were the direct ones, really. We went to the independent schools who had done it. Our, our director of enrollment spoke with some people in other organizations. You only get one shot was critical for us because I think we may have, had we not had that advice, I'm not sure we would have enlisted the support of, of the group we did. I think we might have tried to handle this in-house because we tend to do a lot of those things. And again, there are other schools who definitely could handle this in-house. We were, were small and we, you know, we just felt that we needed somebody who had a little bit more expertise. And I'm glad we did because I think we would have had, you know, just fatigue on messaging had we done it our way. Whereas this was, you know, this was very woven into, you know, our mission and our values and they were able to help us craft the message in a way that felt and was authentic, only I'm not sure we would have done as polished a job of that, I would say. So I'm glad that we had a lot of support on that. I think the other piece that was happening at the time was we, were, we had been delayed on accreditation because of COVID. So we were preparing for accreditation, but we were also kind of in this pause mode on strategic planning. And so we wanted to get going on that, even though you know, if you just follow the traditional order of things, it wasn't quite going to be that way. So we were bringing forth conversations about the strategy, the future of the school, the vision for the school, while we were talking about the financial sustainability and coming out of all of this was, you know, a vision and strategic plan or strategic priorities. So it all worked together. So it always felt like you had a common purpose. And I think that was really important. Had, the, had we made this only about financial sustainability, it, it wasn't as compelling. You know, this was about the education of their children, our, our children. So what's what's next? You did this, you know, big tuition reset. You mentioned that, you know, you sent the clear message, right, that you were able to freeze the tuition, but then there will be kind of the cost of living uh, increases year over year. But I guess what's what's next on the journey of financial sustainability kind of writ large that you're making sure that you're accessible for, you know, many, many families in your region um, to have that top notch education? Like where where do you see this going? Well, I think that's just going to have to be a whole nother podcast. <laughs> we, we, we absolutely are in great conversation about what our strategic priorities are. We just got an EE Ford grant to uh, do some work around social emotional learning and how that's the foundation and how that fits with cultures of belonging to elevate academics. So we have absolutely got some traction on these strategic priorities. We've got a great problem, which is we're full in some places. We need to think about how how to address that that you know problem in terms of how do we grow enrollment when we see demand in certain levels. So we will be doing some strategic work around enrollment and fundraising. So I think those are those are you know they that work needs to continue in terms of tuition. I want to hold true to the promise we made to our families, which is that it would be. Uh, something they can predict. It wouldn't feel like a surprise to them. So we will continue forward on the plan, you know, that we had set in motion a couple of years ago in terms of the way we approach tuition. Well, too, and, and having the exciting problem, right, of being too full in certain areas, I think, is then just that perfect seed for innovation. So <laughs> it's very exciting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, switching gears a little bit, Nancy, I'd love to know more about kind of your professional journey and how you got to be head of school at the new school. Um, did you always see yourself in this role or in, was it always the plan? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> no, I, I started, I actually started my career in the Air Force. I had been in ROTC in college, but I was in the Air Force and I knew that I still knew that I wanted to teach. And I actually, so I had gone through school getting my degree in math knew I wanted to teach, loved the independent school world, but without a teaching certificate, that was absolutely going to be my first step until I could get a master's degree. And I started teaching at um, the Miami Valley School in Dayton, Ohio, which is where I had been stationed in the Air Force. So I started teaching middle school there uh, for a couple of years, but then I returned home. Home for me was Massachusetts. 
And um, after getting my master's degree, I returned to my alma mater, which was Phillips Academy Andover. And I like to tell people I grew up there professionally. I mean, I loved my time, my jobs as teacher, coach, house counselor, great place to raise a family. It was just home for me. And one of the really neat things about the way Andover does their administrative roles was they were, uh, everything was a, rotate, a rotation. So if you got into an administrative role, you were in it for a certain number of years, and then you rotated back out to a full-time teaching position. And so I probably, I mean, I, th- I really thought I'd be there forever. What happened is I was drawn to a school in Wyoming and my husband actually had grown up in Wyoming. So we knew the area well, but the draw that of the school that was strong enough to pull me was that this little tiny school in Wyoming was doing a lot of the things that we were talking about. And I could hear at Andover, I could hear Carol Dweck speak all about growth mindset. And then when I walked into the door at this little school in Wyoming, a second grader looked at me and said, you know, my gra- my brain grew a lot today because I made some really big mistakes. And so the draw of a school that was doing this exciting work, I, I started to believe that maybe I could have a different kind of impact on education and maybe I had the ability or the gift to be able to take what I had learned in my professional life and, and help support others in doing that work. So that's sort of what pulled me away. What drew me to the new school was really, and I know this is very independent school-minded, but again, being a school that was the only independent school in the town was a true whole child approach where I saw that they had this, you know, they valued the science of learning and the art of caring all in one. So they had really strong foundation innovation. And I will always say, because I tell everybody this when they say, why did, you know, what's one thing that you would say about the new school? Truly, the health of the board matters. Because when I was thinking about the challenges that our schools are facing, and this was pre-COVID, I knew that you needed to have a healthy board in order to support the growth of the school. So yeah, I journeyed from Massachusetts to Wyoming to Fayetteville, Arkansas. Zigzagging across the country. (laughs) Yeah, no, never expected it, but love that I get to do this fantastic work. Yeah. And and how about like mentors along the way? Have there been some that you've learned from that have been critical as you've grown as a leader? Absolutely. It's funny. You know, I think about this question a lot because I draw inspiration from so many places and and small moments give me so much inspiration. And I was thinking about a former athlete of mine who's a fantastic teacher, who's an inspiration and, and how much she she, you know, gives to me on a regular basis. But really, when I think from a leadership standpoint, the two that are always present on my shoulders when I'm making decisions. I hear these voices. I I say they're on my shoulders because I hear their voices, but I'm standing on their shoulders. Barbara Chase, Barbara Landis Chase, who was the head of Andover for 18 years, she led with a grace and a strength that just absolutely inspired me on a daily basis. She showed me what strong like looked like, especially for a woman. And that was pretty remarkable. And then the other person who it's almost like a, a mantra in my mind, what would Temba say? What would Temba think about this? Is Temba Makobella, who's the head at Groton for about 10 years now. I mean, he is the one who taught me the value of the impatience for the important things. And he leads with such honor and integrity that I love that I have an example of somebody who can do that for and, and that I can call on that in moments where I have to make hard decisions. So yeah, there, there are, those two voices are always present for me. I feel very lucky. Incredible. And even just having this conversation today, we can hear their influence, right, coming through, (laughs) through this work that you've been leading at the new school. And what about as far as, again, just reflecting on your personal journey, what would you say has been your greatest achievement so far? What are you most proud of, I guess? That's, of course, a hard one, too. I mean, of course, what I'm truly proud of are the moments when I've shown up well, you know, the moments when I've been a good coach or a good teacher, a good mother, a good partner, a good friend, all the things that define myself that my life, those really are all that matters. And that's how I want to show up every day. I was laughing when I think about this because I thought, well, how do you, how do you say this? Like, I, how, how do you stay that way? How do you inspire yourself to do that? You can look around at other people, but along the way, what I've, found that I do for myself is I push myself to tackle some hard challenges. I love Glennon Doyle's, you know, quote, we can do hard things, we can do hard things. And so once upon a time, I decided that I was going to run a 100 mile road race, and I finished it. And that to me is a huge accomplishment, not 
not because a lot of other people don't do that or anything like that, but because that was something that was hard for me. I did it, and it really helps me on a regular basis. Sometimes if I'm facing something, I can look at it and go, if I can run 100 miles, I can do this. Whatever this is, I can do this. I can do hard things. 100. 100. Zero, zero. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Wow. <laughs> I know, right? There are a lot of people who do that in the world, but I, you know, it's, uh, yeah, so uh, things like that, right? But the true inspiration and the true things that you want to be proud of are, are how we impact each other. And that's the most important thing. So, well, Nancy, that is incredible. Thank you so much for our conversation today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Well, thank you for having me. It's been an honor to talk to you, and I appreciate being asked. This this work that we did here was exciting, and I, I hope that other schools can benefit a little bit from any part of it. Thanks for listening to NEIS Member Voices. Next month, we'll continue our focus on financial sustainability with a focus on tuition and enrollment. We hope you'll join us. You can find some related NEIS resources from this episode by visiting NEIS.org slash member voices. You can also keep an eye on that page for information about past and upcoming episodes. Please be sure to subscribe to Member Voices wherever you get your podcasts so that you don't miss an episode. And go back and listen to past episodes you might have missed. If you have feedback for us, please leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform to let us know how we're doing. You can also send us your thoughts and suggestions on what you'd like to hear on a future podcast by emailing membership at nais.org.